Well, anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial is on the rise, including in North America and on the campuses. And pro-Palestinian protesters are turning to vandalism. We're going to break it all down right now with the Foreign Desk Editor-in-Chief, Lisa Daftari, who joins me from Los Angeles. Lisa, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on again. Thank you for having me, Jeanette. Of course. Okay, so pro-Palestinian protesters vandalized churches, businesses, and residential apartment buildings in a Los Angeles Westwood neighborhood during Biden's visit to the area for a fundraiser. So what can you tell us about this, Lisa? That's really close to where you live, right? It is. And um, our team actually went out uh, early in the morning. Um, I actually personally did a drive through that night. So Friday afternoon, they had planned to meet at a nearby park near the residence where the fundraiser was being held. Um, and there was bloody posters of Biden's face trying to get everybody to the park for a protest. Um, and if you see, we have an article on our website saying pro-Palestinian protesters. I know that there are many well-intentioned pro-Palestinian um, activists out there, but there were many many, many violent anti-Semites and pro-Hamas individuals in that group. And I say that because the graffiti that was done all throughout the neighborhood, and again, this is a very affluent um, upper middle class, up, I should say, uh, you know, high end uh, neighborhood surrounding UCLA. So all around the park, the residential buildings, the Starbucks near UCLA, all graffitied with very anti-Semitic um, slogans, um, a lot of profanity, and of course, swastikas. And there's very many, many young children in this very family-oriented um, neighborhood. And so many people took to covering up the graffiti in the morning so that the children wouldn't see it and others wouldn't see it. Uh, but we got, our team got there beforehand. We took about 50 pictures um, of all these different, I mean, churches just covered in graffiti. Um, again, you know, really, really anti-Semitic slogans. Um, and again, this is around the and, the, and we actually got an individual who was walking in with her young family into the fundraiser and they were throwing full bottles of, of water, so it's pretty heavy, at the toddler's heads, calling them uh, child killers and, and, and um, uh, committing genocide and things like that. Um, this family has three young children that we were able to speak to. Just horrific. Uh, and again, this is, you know, they, they were able to uh, shut down three lanes of uh, Wilshire Boulevard going west. Um, and 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 protesting, and we got some of the video of that as well. Some of the people living in the high rises along the corridor were able to uh, get the footage. Um, you know, where where are we drawing the line on on free speech when it comes to you know private and public property um, vandalism? You know, the anti-Semitic tropes. I mean, what is a swastika doing? Uh, you know, it, it's almost as if they have no shame now to blend in a lot of heavy, heavy anti-Semitism and Jew hatred into this. Um, you know. Uh, war and of uh, their political beliefs about Gaza and Israel. So very, very bad. We didn't see that much condemnation. I actually, Jeanette, that was very upsetting. We would have liked to see much more condemnation on something like this because this shouldn't be accepted against any group in the United States. Yeah, I was going to ask you, this was done during Biden's visit. Did, did he address this at all? Did he see it? You know, I, I I don't know if he personally saw it. I mean, it's pretty hard to to get into the, to these homes without seeing all of this or hearing all of this. You know, I had friends who went to a, a few conferences over the last month, and the protesters are so loud banging on the doors outside of these halls, wherever they may be, um, that they they have a hard time conducting their meetings because of the protesters. I mean, you saw a lot of the footage coming out of New York City, out of Chicago, out of Los Angeles, and places where these protests are getting very violent, not only violent, but anti-American. I want to really emphasize that, taking down the American flag and replacing it with the Palestinian one. Um, you know, in, 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 you know, this is never, never something that has been uh, accepted. And I, and I've written about this before, where the anti-Semitism is really rooted in a lot of anti-Americanism as well. Um, this is anti-West, uh, anti-freedom, anti many, many things. And I think, you know, before this gets even further out of hand, we need much more condemnation from um, the, the government, from universities, from Congress. I mean, wherever anti-Semitism is, is being shown. Yeah, absolutely. And good on you and your team also for getting out there, Lisa, and 
getting that footage and stuff because I think it needs to be out there and more people need to be aware of what is going on. And uh, of course, you mentioned right there the, the university. So of course, Democratic New York Governor Kathy Kochel has written a letter warning colleges and universities that she will order legal action against them if they fail to address anti-Semitism uh, on campuses. So this, of course, Lisa, is following that congressional testimony last week where several Ivy League school presidents could not answer questions about anti-Semitism on campus, including Harvard President Claudine Gay. And she's since issued an apology for her remarks. So Lisa, what's going on? Right. So you saw um, the, the leader at, at, at University of Pennsylvania step down. Um, and so did the chancellor. And, you know, I guess um, good for uh, Governor Hochul for getting ahead of this, but it's crazy that it needs to be said. And it's crazy that any adult professional needs to be told that they need to condemn hatred against any group. I mean, fill in any other group other than Jews into the, this, this targeted um, bullying and ha hazing and harassment uh, and hatred on campus, and it, it would never be tolerated. The fact that we have to even have a hearing, the fact that they have to be asked to resign over something like this. I mean, imagine somebody would would rather not call out anti-Semitism and lose their job. Uh, it, it's just the right thing to do. And of course, um, of course, New York governor wants to get ahead of this. I know we've seen anti-Semitism at Columbia, NYU, two very prominent, Cornell, three very prominent universities that are in New York um, that uh, she wants to get ahead of. But it's awful that the names of these universities have to be dragged uh, in the dirt like this and that they have to lose so much funding. And perhaps that's what is um, prompting a lot of this when you're losing millions and millions of dollars in donations mm -hmm. yeah. um, because yeah. you're just not doing the right thing. Um, you know, again, it's crazy. It has to be said. Bravo to uh, anyone who is condemning this, including the governor of New York. And um, I don't know if I should say too little too late or, you know, we, we still can get ahead of this as, as a society. The fact that it has penetrated so deeply that, that they can't even recognize it is what is so disturbing, whether it's the mainstream media, the college campuses, government, um, just, you know, even entertainment. When you look at a lot of these celebrities not understanding um, that what they're saying or doing is so damaging to all, when you cannot condemn hatred against one group, you're allowing it to come into society as a whole, where we are now allowing hatred and bigotry, uh, anti-Semitism, racism, whatever you want to call it, um, whatever brand of hatred it is, if you're allowing it for one group, it's going to come for your group as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Lisa, the Foreign Desk reported on a poll that was done, which showed that 20% of young people say that the Holocaust is a myth. And with all this historical documentation that we have, along with actual footage of concentration camps that's readily available to us to view on YouTube. So how can 20% of young people think that the Holocaust is a myth? Jeanette, let's go one step further. There are people who are saying October 7th is a lie and that these women were not raped and that these, uh, you know, the Israelis were not massacred over a thousand of them. So, and that there are no hostages, even though they're getting released and we have their names and we have the footage of them getting released there were no hostages. This is all a myth. So, you know, obviously it makes sense that they would deny the Holocaust as well, which is very troubling because the last of Holocaust survivors are dying and then there, there will be no more, you know, firsthand testimony, even though, again, the evidence really doesn't do anything for these kinds of people who, who want to believe that these events did not occur. Um, Jeanette, it's really troubling. And, and the troubling part, I just had a conversation with a friend this morning about this, is that that 20% that is denying the Holocaust, that is anti-Semitic, that is on TikTok, that is, you know, they are overrepresented in many ways, right? So we're seeing them in the media, we're seeing them in the news, we're seeing them in, in on uh, social media platforms. We're hearing them much more than we're hearing the 80% of people who obviously understand what Israel's doing, that understand what Israel's going through, that understand the threats of, of terrorism and do not side with Hamas. They don't think Osama bin Laden was lovely. So th this is the issue, is that that 20% being overrepresented re represented in all of these different facets are carrying the narrative, whether it's on college campuses, whether it's on TikTok or Instagram or wherever they may be, or in the halls of Congress, where you had four members of the squad now turned into eight 
overrepresented. They're underexperienced. Their resumes don't speak for anything that they've done in life, but their hatred is very, very loud and getting headlines. And that's the issue here. I think we need to turn this narrative and not give the 20% the voice, but give the 80% sane people in the United States and in the West, give carry that narrative. And really it's a big message to the universities and to the, the, the mainstream media and to, to anyone who cares about the truth and cares about the future of the West has to carry the truth and has to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very good point there. And uh, Lisa, it's been noted that there's been an increase in gun ownership among Jews after the Hamas attack on uh, Israel on October the 7th. So it looks like many Jewish people around the world are choosing to arm themselves for self-defense. So what's, uh, I mean, I guess I can't say I blame them. No. And you know what? It, it's obviously very natural when you wake up and you realize no one's going to defend you and you have to defend yourself. And what's very ironic about this is that Jews, particularly in the United States, are typically Democrats, typically meaning that they are typically anti-gun, where many of them now wake up on October 8th and realize, wait a minute, I might have to defend myself and my family. And that goes maybe against my party line, but I need to do what's best for my family. And I think that, that this reality has come knocking very loudly on the doors of many Jews and others, by the way. Uh, I have a neighbor who's not Jewish and he has, you know, since upped his, his uh, you know, arsenal of guns in his home. Um, he did not previously want to. And, and, and now he feels like the police is not coming for us. You know, the society is not defending many of us. Um, and I, I want to add one more thing. It's not just about Jews here. When we see tree lighting ceremonies in places like California, Gavin Newsom canceled it and he made the tree lighting ceremony online. When we saw in Rockefeller Center, the tree lighting ceremony for Christmas um, being, you know, basically hijacked by violent pro-Hamas demonstrators, then you start to, to wonder if this is really about Jews or the dismantling of the foundation foundation of the West, which is rooted in Judeo-Christian values. And when you start looking at it that way, we have a much bigger problem than just this war against you know, Israel and, and, and Hamas. It goes deeper into individuals trying to undermine the culture and the freedom of the West. So um, they're trying to cancel Christmas, cancel the Jews, do whatever. And I know that a lot of, of, of well-intentioned people, people are waking up to this and understanding this, but there are still those who need to um, really connect the dots on, on what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so getting off of October 7th now and turning to more of the Middle East here, there have actually been more uh, reports about attacks against the U.S. So it was reported that the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was shelled by suspected Iran-backed militias. So it's been reported that these kinds of attacks are actually escalating then, Lisa? Absolutely. And we must actually connect this to October 7th because both of these are being puppeteered by the same control group, which is Iran's regime. Iran's regime has paid Hamas, uh, is supporting Hamas, trained Hamas for October 7th. They then are now going against uh, the United States and attacking U.S. assets with their proxies in the Middle East, which they have set up over the last 10, 15 years. So we have proxies in Yemen. We have proxies in Lebanon called Hezbollah. We have proxies in Syria and Iraq. And now those are becoming much more active towards U.S. assets. So this is, I know the White House tries to separate the two narratives. The White House tried to say that this is something that's a one-off and very quietly handling targeted attacks and retaliating, but then moving you know, back and not allowing this to escalate. The Iran regime would love to have the United States dragged into this war as well. The United States wants to back out of that. Of course, President Biden is coming up on an election. He'd rather attend fundraisers and, and smile and try to, you know, make nice and not admit that we are in, getting involved in another war directly or indirectly and that the Iran regime is targeting our assets every single day. Um, so the, the the White House wants to do everything it can to de-escalate this, separate it from the October 7th war, not get involved and stand back and say, okay, you know, we defend Israel to a certain extent, but we do draw lines X, Y, and Z um, and, and create boundaries that way so that it, it, it prevents this escalation uh, and, and prevents us from getting involved in, in another war. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the U.S. Uh, have added sanctions against two Iranian officials as alleged plots to assassinate U.S. officials have been uncovered. So can you maybe explain more of what's been revealed here, Lisa? Yeah, what's so the, the crazy part about this is that the United States, the, the White House, the current Biden administration, 
Biden campaigned on when he gets back into the White House, he's go when he gets into the White House, I should say, as president, he is going to get back into the Iran nuclear deal, which Pre President Trump pulled out of in May of 2018. And if you recall, the nuclear deal was President Obama's crown jewel of foreign policy in 2015. He got the United States and other world powers to sign on to an Iran nuclear deal, which was supposedly supposed to curb Iran's um, nuclear weapons program. It did not. The centrifuges kept spinning. They went after different parts of their weapons program. They were able to evade sanctions, etc. cetera. Um, President Biden comes into office and he continues this aspiration of getting back into an Iran nuclear deal. Now, at the same time, there are these inconvenient truths about Iran's regime, that they keep hitting our assets, that they are, are, are uh, stealing oil um, you know, tankers in the Middle East, that they are taking hostages, what, American hostages, um, that they are going after our ally Israel, the, and the human rights abuses, and the war against women, and it, the list goes on and on. Now, the, the, the White House has now decided to sanction certain individuals within Iran's regime because of targeted threats against U.S. officials that were under the, Biden, uh, the, the Trump administration. They have tried to assassinate different members, including Pompeo, including John Bolton and others. Uh, they have threatened their lives. We have to now provide 24-hour uh, uh, security for these individuals because of these threats. And the, the White House decided to uh, place sanctions on them. So, I mean, again, people, are pointing out this discrepancy. How can we at the one hand want to normalize relations with such a regime, but on the other hand, put sanctions on individuals because we know that they are still threatening the United States in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're out of time here, Lisa, but of course we could go on and on, but thanks for joining us today. Of course, thank you.